I'm now going to take you off the deep end. For as radical as what I have said up to now might seem to you, we're now going to plunge off to the deep end. Because why? If humans are not pre-humans, or pre-humans are not, don't lead to humans, that they're really hominoids, what are humans? What are we? How do you account for us? The way I account for us is this. Let's go through the lesson real quick. From macro to micro in five steps, the human body contains 100 trillion cells. There is a nucleus inside each human cell except blood cells, sperm cells. Each nucleus, cells. Each nucleus contains 46 chromosomes arranged in 23 pairs. One chromosome of every pair is from each parent. The chromosomes are filled with tightly coiled strands of DNA, genes or segments of DNA that can contain instructions to make proteins the building blocks of life. There will not be a quiz. Just want to kind of go over how it breaks down. Okay, next slide. Targeted gene replacement. This is what we are in the beginning stages of really learning how to do. We're getting pretty good at it, but we've still got a long way to go. But what our guys can do now is take chemicals that will cut through gene segments and splice them out and put other things in there and see what results. And when you get really good at this, you can do virtually anything with any living thing. You can mix and match to your heart's content when you really know what you're doing. Let's, let's, you've got some hunters here. Let's just, for example, let's think what if we wanted to hunt, if we wanted to create something that could really hunt, what would we, we'd, we'd want to create an animal that was really, really fast. So let's model it on a greyhound dog. Really fast, where do they run? About 35 miles an hour, 40, mi 40 miles an hour. But you got some pronghorn antelopes and things out there that can go 40, 45. So let's boost it. Let's supercharge that sucker. Let's, let's put him up to, let's get a greyhound up to 60 miles an hour. 60 miles an hour. Let's do that by lengthening its spine a little bit and making it extra springy so that his rear feet, when he comes up, they don't hit kind of close to his front feet. They hit way out in front so he can really power along. Now, we got ourselves a fat, but a dog doesn't have a killer instinct, does it? They've got to have a cat's killer instinct. Cats do the killing. So now let's, let's give him a greyhound body, but let's give him a cat mentality to hunt. But at 60 miles an hour, what problem do we have? Turns, high speed turns. Can't have a cat's feet because you've got those soft pads and retractable claws. We've got to keep the dog's feet on there. We've got to keep the hard pads and the, the extended claws. So we got to, but we can do it. We can do anything we want. We mix and match and we can make ourselves a real great hunting animal that's a mixture of dogs and cats, right? Next slide. Oh, we already have one. We already have one. A cheetah, ladies and gentlemen, will run 60 miles an hour and absolutely overtake anything on a savanna. It is a domesticated cat, it's called. One of the very first domesticated cats. History going way back as hunting animal. And guess what? They are a blend of cats and dogs. See their fur? The tan part's what you find on a short-haired dog. The black spots are cat fur. See the feet? Dog. See the body? Cat. See the spine? Extended. Stretched out. Let's it run 60 miles an hour. Big heart. Extra lung capacity. Super lungs. High speed turns. Absolutely a mixture of dogs and cats susceptible to diseases that only dogs get and susceptible to diseases only cats get. More importantly, and perhaps most significantly, they're all clones, genetically exactly alike. What's that mean? It means cheetahs are a product of genetic engineering. No question. Yet science insists they all came out of a genetic bottleneck of some kind. That's how it's explained, seriously, a genetic bottleneck. Somehow, all the cheetahs, all the creatures that led to cheetahs, died, except for a very few breeding pairs, somewhere, over the last few thousand years, and they radiated out again to the wide areas they cover now. A bottleneck, a genetic bottleneck. 
It's the only way to explain something that otherwise is inexplicable, totally inexplicable. Now, supposedly cheetahs go back millions of years, like everything else, but as far as domestication goes, we know they've been domesticated the last 5,000 years. They were the one of the first ones, going back to the Egyptians and Sumerians, absolutely one of the very first ones. Okay, that covers the cheetah. Now, this slide covers a lot of things. Domestication is one of the great, untalked about, unexamined mysteries of the world. That goes for wheat, corn, cattle, goats, sheep, anything, and us. Charles Darwin himself said, when you come down to it, humans are more like domesticated animals than anything else. Now, put that aside for a moment. Here's the story we get for wheat and grain and corn and cows, all domesticated plants and animals. This is what we get. Let's start with grains. Somehow in the Stone Age, some bright guy, thousands of years ago, 10,000 years ago or more, looks out of his cave one day and says, you know, if we were to go out there and pull up some of that grass or cereal or grain and bring it into our cave and pick through the little seeds that look like pepper flakes, if you've all seen their seeds, pick through and pick out the biggest ones and plant those and task our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and for the next couple of thousand years, if everybody keeps doing that same thing, pulling out the biggest seeds, eventually we're going to get big seeds that we can actually deal with. We can actually harvest and eat and if we get lucky, if we do all of this for a couple thousand years, if we get lucky, maybe some miracle might change the biochemistry of those seeds and turn them in from things that we absolutely cannot use to some kind of a seed that, that our bodies can use. And furthermore, the way they're designed at the Rachel's and Glooms will allow us to harvest them and get them back somewhere and thrash them and we can get those seeds out. Everything about this has to be changed and that guy stood there at the front of his cave and somehow he had this vision and somehow he was able to pass the word down for hundreds of generations and everybody did it and somehow we wake up one day and we have all these things, domesticated plants, same thing with the animals, looking at the big wild oryx, just a real bad news thing, looking at a wolf and saying, oh yeah, let's bring those in and keep those for several generations and breed the wildness out of them. Yeah, there's going to be some nipped ankles in the cave here for a few generations, but if we stick with it, we're going to get a dog and it'll be really fun. They might have puppies and it'll be fun. You know, to so totally absurd, so totally absurd when you just think about it for five minutes and yet that is totally bought, paid for, signed, sealed and delivered by every major botanist that I know of. Nobody says these kinds of things. Nobody that I'm aware of. But yet it's there. A, a child should be able to see it. And again, so with humans, just like Darwin said, we seem to be like domesticated animals. Next slide. Cerebral cortex comparison. Now, evolution. Rat, if you take the cerebral cortex, which is the outside part of the brain, the outside covering, most closely related to intelligence, this part out here, and you peel it off and you spread it out, of a rat it's about the size of a postage stamp, of a monkey it's about the size of a postcard, of a chimpanzee it's about the area of a sheet of typing paper. And for us, it's four sheets of typing paper. I submit to you that this is not evolution. This is something happening. This is supposedly our closest genetic relative. Something happened genetically to do this. Something happened. It's clear something happened. That is not evolution. But what? Next slide. 